Compliance Office. Uh, I've worked at two different Division I institutions doing athletics compliance. Uh, so if you have any questions, we're going to try to keep this as informal as possible. Raise your hand. Uh, I will call on you. And if your answer is coming up later in the presentation, I'll just let you know. Um, so like I said, if you have any questions, just let me know. A uh, couple things we're going to go over. Steps to achieving NCAA eligibility, uh, the initial eligibility requirements, uh, sports participation, and some resources are at the end. So first thing, what is the NCAA eligibility center? Eligibility Center is what is formerly known as the Clearinghouse. If some of you have older uh, children that maybe uh, were student athletes five, ten years ago, they would have registered with the Clearinghouse. Nowadays, we call it the Eligibility Center. And they do two things for all incoming uh, Division I, Division II student athletes. They're going to certify your academic eligibility and what's called your amateur uh, First thing, steps to achieving your eligibility. This is what uh, I basically break it down by year, what sophomores, juniors, seniors should be doing uh, to make the process go as smooth as possible, because that's what everybody likes. Uh, the first thing, if you're a sophomore in the room, uh, first of all, what ages do we have? Senior, junior, any sophomores in here? One sophomore, okay, perfect. Uh, start playing now, work hard, get your best grades possible. Uh, this applies for every single student. It's extremely hard to bring your GPA up. Uh, once you start off with a very low GPA. So again, be doing well in your classes. Uh, take classes that match your school's list of NCA approved courses. Each high school has what's called 48H with the NCA. And these are approved courses uh, that will count towards them determining your academic eligibility. So if you know you're going to want to play college athletics, have those conversations with your counselor early on and they can make sure you're in the right classes so we don't have issues down the road. Uh, three, if you fall behind, you're either getting bad grades, you fail class, whatever, use summer school to make that up. Do it ahead of time, don't wait until your senior year for summer school. Juniors, uh, this is the time you're going to register with the NCAA Eligibility Center. It's a really easy process. You go to eligibilitycenter.org, and when you get there, it says like, high school student athletes, click here. You click on that, and on the next page, there will be instructions on how to uh, register with the eligibility center. I have a couple screenshots coming up. Uh, register and take the ACT, SAT test, whichever one you want. I don't really care. As long as you're taking one of the tests, you'll be fine. Uh, make sure you're sending the scores to the eligibility center. Their code is 9999. I know some colleges say, don't take the test you know, too many times. It looks bad. For the eligibility purposes, I could care less how many times you take it. Take it as many times as you need to get the grade you want. Um, we will use you know, a verbal from one test score and a math from another to get your best possible score. Again, double check, make sure you're getting with your counselor that you're taking the right courses. Uh, and after your junior year, request that your guidance counselor sends a transcript to the eligibility center. Uh, there is an early academic uh, or certification process, so if you're a really good student, there's a chance we wouldn't even have to worry about half this stuff based off of that junior year transcript. This, again, is the website. It's eligibilitycenter.org. You're going to click in this green area where it says college-bound student-athletes enter here. Uh, the next screen, this is what pops up. You have two options. Uh, if you need to register, you can either click on the phone over here where it says register. If not, click here. Or in the upper right-hand corner, there's a register button also. Um, you will have to remember your password. You are going to have to log back into the system later on. Uh, it's April of your senior year. So that's basically how you would register. Seniors, take again, take the ACT, SAT as many times as you need to get the score that you want. Uh, continue taking those college prep classes that your guidance counselor is putting you into. April 1 of your senior year, you're going to do what's called requesting final amateurism. So when you register, uh, you have to answer a bunch of questions about what teams you've played on, have you ever received expenses. Once April 1st rolls around, you go back in and you say, yes, all of these answers are accurate, or no, I need to update this because I've played on a different team. Uh, once you do that April 1st, you will be good to go. You have nothing left to do. The last thing, and this is kind of an important one, it says graduate on time in your first eight semesters. So what we mean is you have to be very careful with repeating grades. Uh, has anyone in here repeated grades before? Because if not, we can talk afterwards. We can get into more specifics with you. But basically, I've mentioned before the NCA approved classes. You have to complete all those classes within your first eight years. So if you repeat a grade, you have to make sure you have all six, the 16 of those classes in the first four years. 
Uh, I'm not saying you can't graduate in that fifth year, but it makes things a lot harder. Uh, seniors, another thing, this is the My Planner page. When you log in, there's a plan that literally looks like this. And it has, again, you're going to ask questions about you, your coursework, so where you went to high school, uh, sports you played, everything like that. Um, log in. If the NCA has an issue with something they've sent you, they're going to put a, a message on here uh, in your task list area. So log in every now and then and just check to make sure there hasn't been an issue with the transcript or something like that. Um, again, review your amateurism, request that final amateurism on uh, April 1st. And to the right of this, there's a big red button. Once April 1st rolls around, it says like, it's like flashing. It says request final amateurism here. Click on that. The next window that pops up says, are you sure all these answers are accurate? You hit confirm and you're good to go. Uh, and after you graduate, ask your guidance counselor to send an official transcript to the eligibility center with your proof of graduation on there. Almost every single transcript has the graduation date somewhere either on the upper left or upper right hand corner. It says graduation date of June 15, 2014. Uh, if they send a transcript before you've graduated, the NSA is not going to be able to use it. They need to see that proof of graduation on your transcript. So, again, I know a lot of times uh, July is a hard time to get in touch with your guidance counselors. That's why we need you to do it as soon as possible in June. You know, have the bug in their ear of, I am going to be playing college athletics. We need to send this after I graduate. Okay. I'm going to get into a little bit about what the initial eligibility requirements are. A definition of a core course is a course that uh, is college preparatory in nature and is in one of the following subject areas. English, math, and it's algebra one or higher, uh, natural physical science, social science, a foreign language, comparative religion, or philosophy. Um, it's considered, like I said, college prep. It's taught at or above the school's regular academic level, so any remedial classes will most likely not count as an NCAA core course. Uh, and it also has to be taught by a qualified instructor. I have never come across one that hasn't been taught by a qualified instructor, but just, just to be safe, uh, maybe a substitute teacher that hasn't graduated college with a qualified instructor, I don't know. But you really don't have to worry about that. Now it's more for you know, the school. You have a core course time limitation. This is what I kind of touched on earlier with graduating on time. Uh, from the time you enter ninth grade, you have four years, the next eight semesters, to complete your core courses. Um, any courses taken after the graduation date won't be counted. So, um, on time, graduation also means you're graduating with your class. So if everyone in your school is graduating June 1st, you have to graduate June 1st, not July 1st. If you're graduating July 1st, you're not on time with the rest of your class. Um, Division two, slightly different. Uh, you are permitted to use all core courses that you can take all the way up until initial full-time enrollment in college. So that is the one difference. Uh, with Division One, if you graduate on time, there is an exception for one core course after uh, high school graduation. But again, if you're not graduating on time, you're not going to be able to use that one additional core course. So you're saying, what? Oh, that shouldn't be there. Anyway, uh, what do I have to do? To be an NCAA qualifier, which means you're able to receive uh, financial aid, you're able to practice, you're able to compete, you have to complete all of your NCAA approved core courses. You have to graduate from high school. You have to earn the minimum GPA uh, and the matching SAT score. It's what's called the sliding scale. Uh, again, if you meet all these, you'll be a final qualifier. If you don't, you'll be a non-qualifier. I know James Madison, Virginia Tech, UVA, they do not accept non-qualifiers. So being a qualifier is important. There are some schools out there that do accept them. That's great. You're not going to be able to receive athletics aid your first year, practice, or compete. <coughs> And you basically have to sit what's called a year in residence, which means you're just going to classes. Uh, do we have anyone that's going to be a 2016 graduate? You are. Okay. You have a completely different set of standards. I have some paperwork over there, or not paperwork, but a handout over there for you. Um, you're going to have a third classification, so there's the qualifier. You also have what's called academic redshirt starting in 2016, and that means you can practice and receive aid, you just can't compete in your first year. And that's if you have lower SAT GPA. So the 16 core courses, or the core courses I keep on mentioning, for Division I purposes, you have to have 16 of them. You have to have four years of English, three years of math at Division, or at Algebra I or higher, uh, two years of a natural physical science, and one year of it being a lab if it's offered by your school, which I assume your chemistry is probably going to be a lab. Uh, you have to have one additional year of English, math, or science. doesn't matter which one. 
uh, two years of social science, and four years of additional <coughs> courses. It can come from any of the ones up here, or it could be a foreign language, um, like I said, philosophy. Things like PE, art, do not count as four courses. <coughs> Uh, I've had plenty of times before where a student will say, hey, I have a, a 3.0 GPA. The 3.0 GPA is factoring in art, PE, music, all those other electives. My GPA that I look at is just based off of this, these 16 courses. I've seen GPAs go from a 2.9 down to a 2.4 just because they have A's and PE for four straight years. That doesn't help me at all. So again, make sure, I could care less if you're failing PE, get good grades in these classes. By the way, my admissions firm would probably kill me if they didn't say that. <laughs> so the sliding scale. This is for everyone that's going to be enrolling uh, prior to 2016. You'll notice there's two things. There's your core course GPA in one column and an SAT, ACT score. As your core course GPA rises, so you get closer to that 4.0, the required SAT score goes down, and vice versa. As your GPA drops, your SAT score rises. So as you can see, you have a 2.0, is going to need a 1010. 3.5 needs a 400. Yeah? Is that a weighted GPA or unweighted? Uh, it's based off of your school, and it will be weighted based on how your school weights. So uh, I've seen schools where AP classes get, you know, A and an AP class is worth five points instead of four. It's all up to each individual school, and I'd have to look to find out what your school does. Um, but I, I've seen some schools where honors classes are weighted, others where it's not. It's school by school basis. Oh, okay, so a 3.5 may not be the same thing from Monticello High School to Charlottesville High School, but they have different. Usually, di yeah, different usually the grades. district has it the same, yeah. but here to compared to Virginia Beach, it can be completely different. Gotcha. Um, Again, this gets broken down into smaller percentages. This is just a small snapshot. But you see, as your GPA goes down by 0.1, your SAT score rises by 40 points. Everything makes sense? OK. Uh, a lot of schools will not admit you if you have a 400 SAT score. Again, the, the SAT score is just that verbal and math. We don't care about writing. Writing does not exist to us. So it's just those two. Um, the full slide scale can be found on eligibilitycenter.org if you're ever curious. For 2016 and after, so I'm in right here. Uh, again, you still have to have the 16 core courses. 10 of your 16 have to be completed before um, you start your senior year. Uh, and seven out of those 10 have to be English, math, or science. The restrictions are getting harder. Uh, and if you want to compete in your first year, you have to have a minimum GPA of 2.3, which you can see right here. Uh, Everything from here to there means you can practice, compete, receive aid. Everything from there down means you're just practicing and receiving aid, no competition for you. So again, the numbers are the exact same. Uh, I think 2.0 is off by 10 points, but for the most part, they're the exact same. Division two, uh, the core courses that you're going to need, slightly different. Uh, three years of English, two years of math, two years of science, two years of social science. And they do the three additional years of English, math, or science. So if you remember from what division one was, we had the four, three, and uh, two with one additional. They're just giving you more options to use. Uh, and you will also need four years of additional core courses, electives like a foreign language. <coughs> there is no sliding scale, though, for division two purposes. Uh, their minimum, you have to have at least a 2.0 GPA in your core classes and a minimum score of 820 or 68 on the SAT slash ACT, respectively. Uh, they do have partial qualifiers, which is kind of like the academic redshirt, where you're not able to compete. Um, and I'm not an expert, like I said, on Division II stuff, but this is their general rules. As long as you have a 2.0 and an 820 SAT, you'll be able to practice, compete, receive aid at a Division II institution. Uh, as I said earlier, your best score is going to be used to calculate. So if you've taken it twice, you got a 350-470 and a 424-40. We're going to take the 420 and the 470 and combine it to be the 890. Division three, <laughs> unlike Division one and two, there are no set eligibility requirements for Division three institutions. Division three schools get to kind of pick and choose whatever they want to make. So uh, one Division three school could say you have to have a 2.0 in an 820. Another one could say you have to have a 2.5 in an 820. It's up to each individual school to determine what their eligibility standards are going to be. Uh, they also do not offer athletics financial aid. They have financial aid packages through grants and other things, but you're not going to be able to get an athletic scholarship to play Division III uh, 
uh, athletics. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all for Division Three. The nice thing is, uh, my manual for Division One is about 400 pages. Division Three has a very small manual. You're able to do a whole lot more. It's only like 110 pages. Anyway, uh, amateurism. The nice thing, you guys, are, I would assume, are mostly domestic uh, students, not many international students in here. Uh, so you're not going to have as many amateurism issues. Are, are you international? No. I got my hopes up. Uh, yeah, you have to answer all your questions. Like I said, most of the time international students are the ones that are going to run into amateurism issues because over there, uh, especially in Europe, it's not uncommon to receive uh, your expenses be paid for for training, everything like that. But here in America, we typically don't pay for that sort of stuff, so you're not going to have issues with amateurism. Answer the questions honestly. Uh, there is a bylaw 10.1 statement that you have to sign that basically says, I have not lied about any of this stuff, and if I have lied, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. So answer everything honestly, and you guys should all be fine. That's exact word until you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So if you meet all the eligibility requirements, your amateurism and the academic side, you will be able to participate in Division I athletics. I usually keep this pretty short. I mean, here's a resources page. Uh, the NSA puts out a guide for college bound student athletes that you can find online. Uh, there's a quick reference guide. Uh, eligibilitycenter.org also has a lot of information for you. And lastly, uh, I think that might be for you. I've never actually been to that website. Sorry for promoting it. Oh well. Don't worry about nfsh.learn.com. I think that's for the guidance counselors. What questions do we have? Any and all questions? I feel like I've heard some people say that for like a Division three school, that if you um, are an athlete and you're looking to play in that program, but maybe you don't, maybe it's a really small school and they don't, you don't have necessarily the stellar grades that you might have to have had you not had the athletics, that that's an advantage and can offset and maybe give you financial aid through the academics? Uh, yeah, through, I, I know uh, a lot of times smaller schools, Shenandoah University, uh, Bridgewater College, they will offer a lot of academic grants um, and being an athlete is always an easier way to get admitted to any university. So um, that's typically how they would get their student athletes money is through the academic side or through other grants, whether it's first time college enrollee, stuff like that. Does that happen a lot or like can you give me a percentage or a guess? That I do not know. Uh, but I, I would assume most uh, athletes are receiving some sort of financial mm -hmm. compensation through the university. Even though it's Division III, yeah, not technically you, a scholarship. Yeah, okay. even though it's Division III. Um, I mean, it's, a lot of them are private schools and they mm -hmm. cost $40,000 to go to. And they have to get the kids there somehow to compete. No other questions? This is easy. No, no questions about recruiting, anything like that. The recruiting process. Why is, there, why is there a difference between a dead period and a, a quiet period? Okay. Uh, for Division I purposes, there's four different recruiting periods. There's a contact period, which means our coaches can go off campus and have face-to-face -face interaction contact with you. You can come on the campus. Uh, each sport's different. We're talking about the sport of football? Yeah. You're not going to have a contact period until uh, December, January. Yeah. During the... During the, uh, there, there's an evaluation period also. Evaluation period means our coaches can go off campus, they can watch you play, but they're not supposed to come up and talk to you. They're not going to sit by your parents in the stands, everything like that. Uh, you can also come on campus. Quiet period means no one's going off campus, but you can come visit us on campus as much as you'd like. Uh, and a dead period is we're not seeing you, we're not watching you play, uh, there's nothing going on. We're not allowed to go off campus, you're not allowed to come on campus. If some of you have made college visits before and tried to stop by a coach's office and told, sorry, I can't meet with you, there's a chance it could have been a dead period. So don't think they're just being rude and not getting back to you. Um, the reason why there are those rules, a lot of it's come from the coaches association. They've said, hey, during Christmas, we don't want to feel like we have to go out recruiting. We would like a dead period. And same thing for the student athletes. They don't want to feel like they have to participate in a Christmas Eve tournament so they can be seen. Uh, another popular time for dead period is around the NLI signing. There's NLI signing in November and uh, for some sports and for other sports in February. Uh, there's also one in April. Um, and again, they didn't want coaches going to the high school every day 
saying sign, 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 sign. So they put a dead period up. We're not going to you. You're not coming to us. It's a way for the parents, student athletes, to be able to make decisions in peace. Well, also, in, <clears throat> during the dead time, the child can text or call the coach, right? Call, yes. Uh, and the coach, and the coach call. can call back. Correct. That's yep. Uh, so telephone call legislation is different for every sport. The general rule is one telephone call per week. Um, some sports have a contact period exception where they can make it unlimited. Uh, some sports have uh, unlimited telephone calls anytime that's not a dead period. So uh, each sport is slightly different. Uh, Division two, Division three, again, have a different set of rules. Division three, I'm pretty sure they can start calling you anytime they want. Uh, but for Division One purposes, you should not be receiving phone calls from coaches until uh, July 1 before the senior year. Um, if you've ever called a coach and they haven't called you back, that could be why. If you're a parent of a sophomore junior, they're not allowed to call parents of sophomores and juniors. Um, emails are the same way. <coughs> Your student athletes shouldn't be getting emails unless it's about camp related information until uh, September 1 of their junior year. At that point, it can open up and coaches can email any junior they want and juniors can email back. So sometimes our coaches have to be mean and rude, but it's not their fault. So the periods that you're talking about just apply to Division One. Uh, division One have I, I don't believe Division Two has recruiting periods, but I could be wrong. And Division Three is open conversation? Pretty much. Yeah. Division Two, they don't have any. There we go. Yeah, I, I know their rules are a lot more lax than Division One. And we don't have any D2s in Virginia. It's mostly D2 there's, I think there's two. There's uh, Virginia Union oh, and yeah. UVA Wise. Oh, yeah. Uh, HB, yeah. HBC. Any other questions? I'll answer honestly. <laughs> well, you talk about that they cannot contact the kids until their junior year. Telephone or uh, emails. Emails, but then how can you hear that? Okay, the sophomore just committed to go to the school. Just uh, as yeah, that's <laughs> any time. You can come on campus at any point. Mm -hmm. So freshman, sophomore, they can come on campus, meet with coach, and uh, a verbal agreement between a coach and a student athlete means absolutely nothing until you sign on the dotted line. So you can. My son committed to UVA at six years old. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I mean, you can do it at any okay. point. They always get broken. And, you know, again, it's, uh, a coach can say, hey, you have a scholarship. You know, when you're a senior, you have a scholarship. But they can take it away just as easily as they said it. All right. Well, that's all I have. I mean, like I said, I'll stick around if there's any specific questions. Uh, I'll get you some information here. I'm